Hey, I also want to say thank you for the invitation. I'm excited to be here. Um, the speakers prior have uh, helped me out, covered a lot of ground for me. Uh, I am going to also cover a lot of ground, touch on some high points of a very, very complex issue. So I look forward to questions and answers and also the uh, discussion section afterwards. That's very helpful. So I'm going to really focus on how infant feeding mode um, is related to rapid rate of weight gain. So we've already heard that rapid rate of weight gain um, has been linked to later overweight, risk of later overweight. Um, and this is among healthy term infants. So I want to be clear that this is only healthy term infants. When we get into um, infants born, born low birth, birth weight or prematurely, that's a different picture. Um, and infant feeding practices um, that affect that rate of weight gain. And then to talk about just some potential mechanisms, um, and then uh, just briefly touch on some work that we are doing in our lab. And um, the work actually is funded by USDA, so I wanted to make sure and get that covered um, because I don't think it's on the specific slides. And then summary and next steps. So um, as we've heard, uh, rapid rate, uh, weight gain in the early months has been linked to later obesity. And if you look at uh, this article that came out in 2013 where they measured um, weight and length of 47 infants at 3, 6, and 12 months of age and then also performed um, body composition tests after controlling for, at 12 months, after controlling for leg fat mass, rate of gain from 0 to 3 and 3 to 6 months of age was significantly predictive of increased uh, trunk fat mass at 12 months. And then uh, there have been a couple of reviews about this, and in, Wang and colleagues reviewed a lot of factors that are associated with later overweight and specifically looking at rate of infant weight gain and found that among studies that categorized rate of gain, um, those who experienced the most rapid rate of gain before five months were uh, significantly more likely to be overweight as children or adolescents than those who were in the lowest rate of gain. Uh, and then when, we looked at, when they looked at this continuously, looking at BMIZ scores, grams per day or grams per month, the relationship held up in that um, more rapid weight gain was associated with an increased rate or an increased risk of overweight at four and seven years. So Ong and colleagues who have some overlap in the uh, articles that were reviewed um, also found the relationship. And specifically, though, they, they, they reviewed articles that followed up to 32 years of age. So this relationship is holding true um, you know, on up there. So overfeeding in infancy, um, especially via infant feeding modes other than breastfeeding, may drive some of this excessive gain. So we've heard a little bit about how breastfeeding um, might be a protective factor. Uh, and we'll talk about possibly why this could be. Um, Formula-fed infants appear to consume more energy than breastfed infants, and breastfeeding appears to slow growth velocity as compared to formula feeding. These studies are relatively difficult to do because um, exclusive formula feeding isn't necessarily very common, and uh, combination feeding with formula feeding and breastfeeding uh, is also somewhat common. Um, but we've always already heard that early introduction of solid foods prior to four months of age and then adhering to a feeding schedule uh, has also been associated with rapid uh, weight gain. So again, just to briefly touch on what's going on here, uh, there are, we think, two sort of things going on and likely they're both happening and so this is what makes it even more difficult to tease out. But we have the biochemical uh, mechanisms, so the presence of appetite regulating hormones in human milk that we think support some degree of infant self regulation of energy intake. And so um, they're getting uh, hormones and um, products that are interacting with the infant gut and really helping that infant to decide when they're, when they're full. Um, there's also the idea that excessive protein intakes from formula. Uh, could be increasing circulating insulin levels, increasing hunger, uh, the renal solute load might be driving increased thirst, and then possibly overconsumption when the baby uh, cries because they're maybe thirsty, 
they get another bottle of formula, and so it's not really solving that problem. Um, and then there's emerging evidence that lower protein formulas may help to reduce this risk of later overweight, but these are very new um, and need to be interpreted with caution. So behavioral factors, which is really more what I work with, uh, is the, um, the idea that the control, if you are not breastfeeding, the control tends to move to the, the mother or the caregiver. And so whereas a breastfeeding mother, um, well, let me first say, moms are excellent at knowing when babies are hungry. They're not so great at knowing when babies are full. So if you think about a breastfeeding baby, has anybody in here breastfed a child? Okay, so most of the time, you don't have to decide when they're full. They let you know, right? They either fall asleep or they are too excited about something else in the older child. Um, or uh, if you try to continually offer the breast, they'll, they'll bite you. <laughs> so it's, we know. Um, if you introduce a bottle, then how many of you have seen that bottle following the head of that infant that's looking everywhere, right? It's, it's just what you do. You're talking and you're moving that bottle and making sure that they're getting that um, formula or pumped breast milk, which is a whole other new thing that's happening. Um, but if a baby is not interested in consuming more of that formula, um, if, if the caregiver is not paying a lot of attention, they could get a good amount of formula in um, before the decision is made that the feed is over. And certainly if they try to bite, that's not going to do anything, right? So we do think a lot of that control moves away from the child. So this is um, one of the big areas that we're trying to look at. Beyond that, looking at what's actually in the bottle um, is something that I think uh, we need to look at a lot more closely. Um, and so bottles, uh, infant formula is a very interesting thing as far as marketing and the perception of mothers and, and um, sort of brand loyalty. Um, mothers are very loyal, but then they're also very willing to change whatever that formula is by adding more water, less water, adding cereal, which is something we hear a lot. Um, and certainly in our population, some other things that are um, maybe more unique to the area that, that I work in. Um, and so we, we can't necessarily assume that each bottle contains 20 calories per ounce, which is what we, what we assume. So when we think about issues that are relevant to us um, as SEC, as an SEC group, um, we've already sort of looked at or heard a little bit about breastfeeding recommendations. So here, we have on the, on the top line, our, our national goals is to have at least 80% of our population ever breastfed, so at least once in the hospital, typically. Um, and then a couple of columns over to be still exclusively breastfeeding at three months, so no other foods or fluids. Uh, and, and so you can see that the expectation or the objective drops because we know that there's a lot that goes on in those first few months that decrease the likelihood that that's going to happen, but we do want to encourage that as a goal. So um, you can see that as a nation, we're getting kind of close to percent ever breastfed. Um, but every, when we look at all of our SEC schools, n none of those states are um, getting to that, except maybe Texas is really close. So um, as, a, as a Southeast, we don't tend to do as well. If you replace this with the Northwest, states, you would have the picture of those that are pulling that average up. So we have a, a lot of work to do, but no one state, the red, sorry, are low and the blues are high in that, in that column, but no one state is, is doing any worse or any better than another. We all have lots to do. So um, formula feeding families, so though an effort is made to encourage breastfeeding, as you can see, if 75 or 70 percent of infants are offered the breast, that means 30% aren't. And one would assume that those are getting formula. And by the time they come home from the hospital, a lot more of them are going to start having formula um, offered to them. So we, uh, we need to really pay attention to what's happening there. Um, and certainly in our population, we think about 30% of moms 
are um, putting cereal in the bottle, um, probably doing some other modifications, but this isn't necessarily uh, only lower income moms, but that's the group that we're working with right now. Okay, so just very rapidly, um, I wanted to go through some uh, formula sample analysis that we've done with low income formula feeding mothers. And what we did is at two and four months of age, we asked moms to record for 48 hours every bottle that they offered, uh, how big that bottle was, if they offered cereal, and if they did, how much did they put in the bottle, what was remaining at the end of the food feed, um, if they can estimate how much might have been lost to spit up, and then other foods and fluids that were offered. In the second 24 hours, we asked them to then provide a sample of formula. So then we took that sample and um, we analyzed it. And so what I'm going to just show here is a comparison between that paper record and then what we actually found in analysis. So from the paper, we assume that prepared formula is 20 calories per ounce. If they offered cereal, we added the calories that we thought they added to that bottle, and then we had an overall average um, intake. And then for the actual variable, we calculated macronutrient values we had to add a correction factor. Um, and when we averaged that for the total calories offered and average over those two days. So if you look at this, um, at the first observation, which is month two, and the second observation, which is month four, their actual calories per ounce from the chemical analysis is about 20 at the first time point and 25 at the second. So now, to give you some perspective, um, 22 to 24 calories per ounce is what's used as sort of catch-up calories per ounce in the uh, NICU for a premature infant who wants to, we want to try to grow them a little bit quicker. So these are, these are on the high end by four months of age. Um, and so when we look at that by um, cereal users, and these are just people who reported any use of cereal on their food record, they are higher, uh, 22 calories per ounce at the first time point um, higher than the, the non-zero users, which are 19.2. So 19.2, again, is lower than the 20 that we would have estimated. So our bottom, our, we have never went below 20 based on the paper record. So here we can see that they actually are a little bit below 20. Um, but 18 to 22 is relatively, is sort of within a normal range. When we move on to month four, you can see that the serial users are uh, having this high energy density, but so are the, the um, people reporting not using cereal. So they're either adding more water, or sorry, less water, or adding other um, things to the bottle. So when we started looking at how many calories per day was actually going in, based on the paper record, we had about 585 calories. Then we looked at the chemical analysis and found that it was about 26 calories less. So we're sort of overestimating what they're actually getting. Um, and then we adjusted for one outlier, and um, it was about 30 calories per ounce. Sorry, 30 calories per day difference. So we wanted to look at a scatter plot to try to figure out what was going on. And, and it's obvious that when you don't go below that threshold of 20, we never estimated based on the paper copy that moms were giving less than 20 calories per ounce, um, then we don't really see much of a relationship with later weight at four months of age. So this is two, two months and then uh, two month intake compared to four month weight, um, com controlling for birth weight. But if you look at the scatter plot on the, um, on the right, where we put in the chemical analysis, you can see that there's a good amount of uh, mothers who have samples that are less than 20 calories per ounce. Um, and if you look, I think the lowest one on there is around 7 calories per ounce. So that would not have been captured at all by our food record. So just to summarize very quickly, uh, variability in energy density of bottle contents may be greater than is currently assumed. And results indicate that the assumption of 20 calories per ounce may not accurately represent calorie intake, um, especially as they don't allow for underestimates. 
So this lack of variability in calorie estimates based on maternal intake record may reduce the ability to, to detect association with later weight, um, and these factors should be explored more fully. We also, um, results indicate that assumptions of caloric contents of infant formula can be somewhat um, inaccurate and can be explained, and may explain to some extent some of these differences in weight, rate of gain. Um, so, Promoting and supporting breastfeeding where very, very little decision is made beyond whether they're hungry and letting them decide uh, when to end the feed is sort of the simplest approach. We all know there are many factors related to why moms actually do breastfeed, so that's a, a bit of a naive statement, but certainly um, taking that control back might be um, very beneficial. Uh, and if not, we need to really be talking to moms about what they're doing with formula um, and talking to other individuals who are also um, providing that formula. And at that, I will take questions and answers, or questions. Hi, thank you, that was very informative. Um, I just had a question. Um, if you were uh, about to move from exclusive breastfeeding to introducing some other foods, uh, what age would you do that personally? I know there's a lot of different data on that. And also, um, is there any indications with the child that may be an indicator that they're ready for another type of food? Oh wow, those are great questions. Um, so, uh, me personally, um, six months is the recommendation to exclusively breastfeed from the American Academy of Pediatrics, and that's certainly what I was able to do with my kids. Um, the issue to be considering is testing for anemia. So if, well, you can give um, iron drops, so you would still be um, exclusively breastfeeding if your child needed iron drops. Um, that's within the realm of exclusive. Um, but as far as indicators, that's sort of um, a wide open question. We know what moms consider to be indicators, but I'm not sure that we know beyond um, the issues, say, of iron deficiency anemia, that maybe there might be a reason to start introducing other foods if you didn't have access to iron drops. Um, but for the vast majority of children, six months, if they're breastfed, six months is the um, will cover, will, m the majority of kids can go that far. I didn't say that exactly right. But, um, but you know, reaching for food or crying when mom's making food or, um, you know, salivating and so forth, these aren't necessarily indicators that they're ready. Um, but they're certainly considered um, that way in, in the mom's eyes. So it's a difficult. Um, decision or, or education point, I think. Did that answer your question? Um, Jane, over here. <laughs> Jane McElroy, University of Missouri. Um, thank you for your talk, that was wonderful. Um, I know nothing about this, so this is a really naive question. Um, but you, you made me curious when you say, oh, the pumping was a whole other issue. Oh, yeah. Could you just, like, like take, uh, my curiosity is very wet. Can you just speak briefly about that? Sure, what sure. What do you need? So, oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, great question. So pumping it, um, would be to use a breast pump, you know, to provide the formula or the breast milk. Um, and what we have found is that where that used to be relatively uncommon and, and used in sort of dire circumstances, somebody is in the NICU or something like that, um, or a mom who's going back to work who would use that as a supplement to actually breastfeeding at the breast, we're seeing a, sort of this upswell of moms who do that only, you know, primarily or only, which is a whole new phenomenon. Um, and, and it used to be that you know, we really wanted to find these moms to sort of study the difference between is it what's in the bottle or is it how the bottle's being used. Um, but we couldn't find any that were exclusively bottle feeding breast milk in the bottle. But now it's, it's becoming more and more common. And so those, that research can now occur. Um, but it's not something I think that anybody predicted would be happening. Does that answer your question? 
don't know anything yet. Um, well, we do know that there is an interaction. There is uh, some control that is going to the moms, um, but the baby is, they're still able to do some self-regulation, but it is affecting that, if I remember that correctly. Uh, yes, back here. Uh, Joshua Brown, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. Um, just had a quick question regarding um, if you saw a prevalence between uh, mothers who were breastfeeding and mothers who were formula feeding, um, if the tendency to return back to a bottle formula was prevalent in lower socioeconomic classes. Uh, I'm not sure, to return back to the bottle? If mothers who were, if, if returning to work, if mothers who were in those lower socioeconomic classes, would they turn to using a bottle formula instead of using uh, breastfed formulas? Absolutely, that is a risk factor. Um, and, and we can definitely go into detail in discussion if you're gonna be able to go to that, because it's a, an excellent point. I think I'm done though, <laughs> sorry. <laughs>